What's good, you YouTube? Alex here, aka Inch95, bringing you guys actually a really special video. Um, this is going to be a retro deck profile on Gladiator Beast, believe it or not. People keep asking me for current Gladiator Beast, all this other stuff, but I was like, you know what? I haven't done a retro deck profile in a while, and I wanted to profile a deck that is personally really close to me because it's one of my favorite decks of all time, and uh, it's it's just a really special deck to me, and it's it, it just represents one of the a format where veteran players could really succeed if you really knew what you're doing you were going to be really good um and, and ultimately i believe this is one of the most um one of the most unique mirror matches of all time that could occur when two great players play against each other with gladiator beast this was during the um post, post dark arm return format this deck kind of swarmed over dark arm return uh once it was released especially once this guy was released uh gladiator beast guys Aris, um in light of destruction and uh, I'm going to try to keep a lot of the, the things that you guys may or may not know already, like, brief. But I'm going to explain some of the unique intricacies of this format. Um, especially for Guide Air Beast. It was basically between 07 and 08 in terms, uh, between that March format. And then once Teledad came out in, like, toward, once Dual Stenesis were, were released towards the end of uh, 2008, which was around, like, September is when that Teledad format started. And then, you know, Teledad exploded in this deck. It didn't lose a ton of steam, but, you know, Beastiary getting hit and all that. But this is basically the profile on the, when the deck was in its prime. Um, I looked through a bunch of old deck lists on um, Metagame, just some old archives. And I pulled up some of my old deck lists as well. And uh, I pretty much just wanted to sh uh, showcase um, kind of like what a standard version might, may or may not look like off by, like, a couple cards. But uh, I also have the side deck and extra deck here. Actually, we didn't really call it an extra deck. It was just a fusion deck back then. Um, so yeah, I'm going to hop right into the deck and uh, explain some of the unique things about this deck. Um, the deck ran the Hero Engine, Stratos, and two Prismas. Um, the Stratos was probably the most important floater in the game at the time, especially once Dark Arm Return and PC Monarchs and all those things um, real, were running the Destiny Hero Engine. And this deck it was just crucial to get uh, Prisma, and it was just a really important play. A lot of the time, players would Solemn Judgment this um, because of such a crazy, crazy power play. Like, it generated so much advantage. Um... And then Prisma back then basically would use this to dump your Beast Yari, and you had three in the deck at that time, which was insane. Um, and you could even dump Laquari and set up uh, Herc plays, but a lot of the time you'd be dumping Beast Yari for your three Test Tigers, and you would use these in conjunction with, with those to set up plays by dumping your uh, Beast Yaris and whatnot. For the Gladiator Beast, um, we didn't actually have too much um, of a, a like too much utility because we didn't have Retiari and whatnot at this time. We didn't have Sam Knights during like. After a couple formats, we obviously got Sam Knight, and Rescue Cat was like at one and two. Um, people would run Sam Knights and stuff, but we didn't have those. We didn't even have Retiari, we didn't have Chariot, we didn't have a quest. So uh, you couldn't cycle through all those things. Um, people really weren't running Proving Ground. It was more of like a standard skeleton. So uh, you would run the uh, obvious Laquaries. You would be running three Beastiaries. This guy was crazy. This is also one of the reasons why uh, this deck had a huge advantage over Dark Arm Return, was because you could constantly just pop their back rows. Um, you could set up, if you could set up a quick Heraclinos with this deck against Dark Arm Return and just keep drawing cards, um, you would more than often win. And uh, the side decking capabilities um, with this deck also took down one of the, arguably one of the most, you know, probably in the top, like, five most powerful decks of all time. So I, I would put GBs up there, you know, it'd be, you know, up in that, you know, Teledad, Frog FTK, Dark Arm Return age, you know, Frog, Frog FTK being obviously, like, one of the stupidest, but, um... As far as like crazy, like insane, powerful decks, so this is—I would argue this is one of the best of all time, just because it's so versatile. Um, you ran—you had to run the two Darius because of the, you know, the Prismas and stuff. Uh, one Ramil. Some players opted to run two, but uh, I think most players just opted to run one. Uh, Hoplimus. Um, most players actually were back and forth on this. Uh, I don't, I don't think I would. I should probably be featuring this, but I figured I'd show it off anyway. I would add it in this deck list. I believe the deck list is like 41 in here. Uh, most people ran between 40 and 42. It actually, like, this is one of those decks that could fluctuate in card count. But uh, the only reason this guy was kind of average at times was because once you got into the top tables, you could be playing a lot of mirror matches, and you didn't want them attacking to this, getting a Mermillo. But uh, aside from that, this guy was great, especially against uh, Corn Monarchs. He was great against Dark Arm Return. It was great against a lot of things, just, like, walling up and sitting there, um, especially against Monarchs. Like, they would have to Monarch this guy. If they didn't have an answer to this big defender... Well, they couldn't do anything, and he was a great out against Prime Material Dragon, which was Corn Monarchs and Prime Material Monarchs were one of the like true toughest decks to beat with this deck, believe it or not, because of the way that they could just negate stuff and slow roll the game just like you. And then the last GB was Secutor. Pretty much, you know, he was he was the bread and one of the bread and butter type GBs. 
Um, you could resolve him so easily. You know, you could do the Prisma, Dump Bestiari, or Laquari, Test Tiger, get Secutor, attack, um, bring shit back with Darius, Darius, you know, get two out, you know, you could Geyseris, and then you could Herc. Like, it's insane. Secutor is just, it's an amazing gladiator beast. It's it's one of my, it, it, it's, believe it or not, I draw it all the time, but it's still one of my favorites of all time. For the non-GB monsters, um, Boohoo, we did run Sangen back then. This deck ran Sangen. We ran one Spirit Reaper. Um, a lot of players were back and forth on this card, but at the same time, a lot of players on this card was one Morphing Jar, and I'll, I'll talk about this card in a second. And then we ran two uh, DD Crows. These were pretty much against Dark Arm Return, against uh, Treeborn Frogs, or Treeborn Frog, because I believe it was at one at the time. It was against Premature Burial and Monster Reborn, because both of those were in the format at the time. Um, against Mirror Matches, you could hit their Darius, which was a huge play, removing their Bestiari. Um, and as well as on top of that, these top four monsters up here, the two DD Crows, Reaper, and Sangin, they were all Crush Card Virus targets. So yes, Crush Card Virus was legal at the time, if you guys did not know that. Um, so those were huge. Reaper walled up against a lot of stuff. He wasn't that good at Mirror Match, so you'd obviously sign him out, but everybody ran him. He was so powerful. That little plus one was huge. And Sangin could, could virtually search out anything. Morphing Jar, on the other hand, was a card that is, I would argue, this is probably... Um, it could be considered a really degenerate card, especially if you use it in, like, empty jar and stuff. But I would argue this is one of the most, um, skillful cards in the game. I feel like if you know how to play Morphing Jar right, Morphing Jar overall in the game of Yu-Gi-Oh, um, you could be one of the most successful players in the game. It's not used that much anymore just because flipping and the mechanic behind setting monsters is kind of outdated. But Morphing Jar in itself is one of the toughest cards in the game to play because it could either win you the game, lose you the game, or even if you draw even or you both draw bad, um, you'd have to know, like, giving your opponent that many pluses, or potentially pluses, because you could even minus your opponent. There's times where, like, you could flip this, and they could have, like, six in hand, and you could basically, it's technically a minus one for them, and you draw five. So th those card changes, like this card, could potentially bring some of the biggest changes in card advantage between you and your opponent, and ultimately it could decide the game so when you use this. But uh, imagine having, like, a Heraclean else on board, having like one or two cards in hand, then top decking a tr uh, Morphing Jar and just setting it with like maybe Protection or something, or like a Solemn Judgment, flipping this and drawing five, like that's that's insane. Like Morphing Jar is just really ridiculous and it wasn't, the game wasn't as fast-paced to the point where you could not use it. So a lot of decks would use it. Um, and you could abuse it with like Book of Moon. For the spell, the, the mo average monster on lip was about 20 to 22 monsters, um, depending on what it was. Um, two reinforcement of the armies to get your... Uh, your Prisma and your your Prismas and your Stratos, mainly your Stratos, which would net your Prisma. And then you could use these late game as well to get your Prismas when they would be shuffled back into the deck. Um, this is one of the random one-of cards that a lot, some players opted to use. A lot of players side decked it as a one-of. It was great in the mirror match um, and against Monarchs. That's why I would personally opt to run it. But I figured I'd show it anyway because it was at one at the time. And uh, it was great in the deck, like being able to just put, uh, smash and then attack. It was, it was great. Book of Moon had just come up to two on this list. So uh, it was great for this deck, a lot of defensive and offensive purposes. Um, Book of Moon is one of the most, I would argue this is the most versatile um, quick play spell in the game. Uh, MST is at 3 right now, yes, but you know, Book of Moon is arguably, in my opinion, my favorite quick play spell at that, and it's just, it's the best, it was the best quick play spell that like, could do so many different things, you know what I mean? Like you could reset stuff, you could set stuff. We didn't have Synchroing Exceeding at the time, um, so you couldn't really like, it wasn't used to interrupt those types of plays. It was more used to interrupt, um, you know, slow rolling games, monster effects. Um, in mirror match, you got to keep in mind you obviously can't. You know, if you book their monster, you can still contact if it's face down. So a lot of players, you know, you got to keep that in mind. Um, for the ob obvious like broken spells that were in this format, were premature burial, monster reborn. Um, you wanted to save your one MST because MST was at one in this format for the premature usually. Um, Another holy grail in this format, the three cold waves. This card was the absolute nuts. This card was the ice age. This card is literally the, uh, the, the ice man cometh. Um, it literally does what the picture is. It freezes over your opponent as well as you for a turn, but that's really irrelevant. This card created so many locks, um, and for a while, even after GB format, this card was still at two. It was at one for a while, and then eventually, obviously, now it's banned, but um, cold wave is just such a degenerate card. Um, you could set up so many plays. Imagine just going cold wave, your opponent soloming, um, you soloming back, them soloming because Solom was at three, and then you know just just doing go, going back and forth, trying to prevent this card from hitting the board, and then trying to prevent them on top of that from uh, from not going Geyseris or Herc or whatever or Secutor play, netting all those pluses, and then you not being able to use any of your spell traps to come back and only relying on your monsters to come back. That is why this card is absolutely degenerate, and it it just simply just. 
it, it's insane. The card itself is it deserves a spot on the ban list. Um, it's one of my favorite cards of all time, obviously, but it's just the nostalgia factor. But it's a it's a broken card nonetheless, and it, it's some people opted to play two. I would never run less than two. And even now that I look back on this, I would never run less than two. Why would you not run a card that shuts down two game mechanics? You know, there, there's or not game mechanics, but game attributes. I guess you could call them in terms of like monster spell or trap. It shuts down spells and traps for basically two whole turns, your turn and their turn. That's insane. So, uh, Cold Wave. Your Heavy Storm was at 1. You had to use it smart, obviously. Heavy Storm's always been at 1. Um, and MST more so. You had to use this at 1, which is really smart. Especially against Prime Material Monarchs, a lot of them uh, would side into cards like uh, Royal Oppression. It was at 3, so Royal Oppression. You really wanted to stop cards like Premature, Bur or Premature uh, Burial and whatnot. So, there's a lot of times where you never really blind spaced. You always conserve this card, just like in GOAT format and other formats like of the such. Um, you really just conserve Mystical Space Typhoon. The Staple 9. This is the one of the trap holy grails of Yu-Gi-Oh in my in my time. This is probably my favorite trap card in the game, um, and probably the most versatile and skilled card in the game uh, as far as playing it. Solemn Judgment, aside from Morphing Draw, obviously, but in terms of traps, Solemn Judgment was at three. Again, the nostalgia factor is right there. Um, this is why the game was so tutored towards um, veteran players back in the day. Solemn Judgment would simply just be. A type of card where it, even in the falling format after GB format um, in Teledide, which is why these formats were so tough to play in because, yes, there could be those hands where, like, in Teledide, you could argue, yes, they would draw broken, they would summon shit. Whoever went off first would usually lose because, you know, the, comeback, they, the second player would come back with all their Solemns and Wind Blast and Oppression, then go off, and they wouldn't have these to stop them. But um, this card, the fact that, like, you could have two or three of these, up to two, three of these face down. You could have, you know, cards like Bottomless. You could have Book of Moons. You could have all these other cards. You could have Bluffs. Bluffing was huge in the game then. Um, it's not as, you know, prominent right now just because of the massive destruction with every deck. Um, but Solemn Judgment, um, you had to know how to Solemn Judgment. You cannot randomly Solemn Judgment. There were times where you couldn't just Solemn a Heavy Storm. You couldn't just Solemn a Reborn. You had to know what to Solemn, when to Solemn, why you were Solemn. You could not arbitrarily set it and then lose out to Cold Wave because they would just soul them back. And then you would lose because of multiple pokes, and then you would have no board presence, you would have no life, you would have no option to come back. This is by far the best counter trap in the game. Um, it's it's just, it's that good. It's it's probably, it's my favorite counter trap in the game for sure. So versatile. You have to know how to play it. Two Bottomlesses, um, one Torrential and one Mirror Force. These were at one, so you had to use these as power cards or power traps in a sense. Um, you couldn't stupidly just burn these like you could now. Um, you had to make reads on these. And then two more Holy Grails that are currently banned. Um, uh, <laughs> I almost said Bottomless again. Uh, Bowden, Top, and Fale, also known as Trap Dust Shoot. Um, this card was amazing in the game back then because of all the searching capabilities. Dark Arm Return was huge. Don't get me wrong. Gladder Beast took over. Yes, they won some of the most jumps just like Teledad. Like, in consecutively, they had like 13, 14 consecutive jumps or some shit like that. I don't know. But uh, you would usually want to play this card very smart just like you would CCV. Um, you would wait until they roted for whatever, like whether it be Stratos or Prisma or whatever. Um, or they did some type of searching or drawing. Then you do this. You don't want to arbitrarily just do it turn one. A lot of the veterans would abuse that against other players because you could still write down notes back then. So this card was huge. You can't write down notes anymore, and you can't write down people's hands. So, uh, you know, there's reads. There's DD Crow reads to be made. There, this was literally the only hand trap in the game that was relevant at the time. Um, we didn't even have really any of their hand traps. So, I mean, you have to keep that in mind. You had to make those reads, and you would want to shut down their plays once they do their initial search, not before, because they could they could have drawn like all spells and traps, for instance. And then the holy grail of traps besides Soul Judgment is the one and only Crush Card Virus. This card won game single-handedly. Players would ultimately just just cry, bitch, leave, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Tables, they would flip out. It was an expensive card. This was probably the most expensive card in the deck. Soul Judgment was up there. Um, Test Eggers got up there at one point. But a Crush Card Virus could have been anywhere from $200 to $250. Um, it, it you know fluctuated anywhere from 150 to 250. You know in those couple of years right there. But uh, Crush Card Virus is nonetheless amazing. There's so many ways to resolve the effect. You have basically, in a sense, you don't just have these four targets. Um, with Sangin Reaper and 2D Crows. If you guys also noticed, I didn't main deck Brain Control in here. In my personal version, I would always main deck Brain Control. That is an absolute power card. I never un understood the mentality of players um side decking Brain Control and GBs like. I get the sense, oh, you're only going to use it against Mirror Match. Yes, we didn't have Synchroing or Exceeding or any of that.
but it's a power card that wins you the game. You, if you resolve it, you usually win. Um, and on top of that, like it's just in, in Monarchs, obviously you had to main deck it. But in in this in this game, I would always main it. You know, you had the Crush Card Virus option. You had the you know these options right here. You had the four targets, and uh, you're gonna main deck. You're, you're gonna pretty much board in brain control against almost every matchup, like, especially like Monarchs against those big beat sticks. Um, you're gonna you know you're gonna main board it in against mirror match, obviously. So you know you have that. That those are other targets. Most players often decided just because of room. But a crush card virus, it's it's CCV. There's really nothing else that can be said about it. That the extra deck we did not call an extra deck. We actually called it a fusion deck, and it was unlimited at the time. Uh, the deck ran three guys Aris. Um, yes, I'm mismatching purposefully because I wanted to ask if anybody has any of these uh, YCS battle pack tournament um, guys Aris's. I want more of these. If anybody can get these or have seen these, they're kind of expensive, but I really want them. So I want guys Aris's. Guys Aris was the reason why GBs molded into what they were. Um, it wasn't because of the lockdown Herc. It was because of this guy. This guy was a monarch on steroids. <coughs> this was probably the biggest type of plus card that we'd, we had seen um, in a given monster in itself, just because of the fact that you could simply plop this guy down so easily. Pop cards, have your opponent unlock with cards such as, um, you know, Cold Wave and whatnot, and you could virtually just steal a game with this guy. And then after you resolve this guy, you could basically bring a card that shuts down another game mechanic, which again, he's a cold wave in himself with discarding cards, which is Heraclinos. This guy was up to between $100 and $150 at, at the time. You could even trade these at times for Dark Arms, like, and Dark Arm was up there. Like, I had seen people trade these in Dark Arms, vice versa for these. So uh, this card was insane. These cards are really what, what brought the deck a lot of steam, especially the Geyseris. The Geyseris is just... So it's 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 the icing on the cake for this deck basically. Um, they ran um, most of the time. You saw cards like Grand Neos of people running Grand Mole or whatever to dump with uh with Prisma just to just to thin out your deck. Reaper on the Nightmare. You 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 could reveal uh, Spirit Reaper for Prisma and then like reborn the Reaper back or whatever. And then you could have like Crush Card and you could attack Crush Card Book It or whatever if they had something. Um, so you could do that. And then same thing with Sandwich. Um, if you had, a, if you want, had, wanted to do a crush card virus play really easily, like imagine being able to have a searchable crush card virus target. That is an option that this deck offered you. You could literally have, let's see, you could have premature reborn, right? And let's say you could have any form of these. You obviously have to have the crush card. So let's say you had the crush card or whatever, with like a solemn judgment, right? Mind you, you had three solemns, so you were bound to have that. You could reveal this for a prisma once you searched it in pretty much one of these five ways besides drawing it because you these could search it these could get it and you could set up a crush card virus play so, so easily once you get this on board you could dump this let's say you go like premature reborn on the sangan or whatever right bring this back and then you have an instant crush card virus plus a free search that is insane you should not that that should hardly even be legal you know like that that's why obviously these cards are banned but um these cards are just the tutor ability the searching is insane um, I couldn't find a Grand Neos because of Grand Mole, but I was, I'm just going to show you guys some other cards that people also, um, especially this main, like the side deck cards that people ran at the time. I'm not going to go in too much as in-depth as the main deck in this it, with the side deck cards. There's also a couple cards you could opt to main, but uh, cards that people opted the side deck, there were Crush, Rescue Cat was at three. Uh, most people just sided two along with two Dark Panthers. This was for the mirror match. You could get these two, bring out a Dark Panther and a Test Tiger. And what you could do with that is, um, if you're playing in Mirror Match and they have a GB on board, right? Um, what they would do is you would copy their Gladiator Beast monster. That's what Dark Panther does. So it copies its name or whatever, and it gets its effect. So not only could you do the, you know, the plays with it by itself, or you could instantaneously, if you had a Beast Yard Engrave, you could instantly just Test Tiger it, put it back in the deck, get Darius, bring out the Beast Yard, pop, attack. That's insane, you know, that's crazy. The fact that people saw these plays and thought of these um, was great. Another card that was also a lot of uh, in, in a lot of main decks, I just put it here just, just to show it off. Grand Mole, you could do the Neos play with it, like I said, if you have a Grand Neos. Um, he's great, he just bounced his. There weren't really any Exceeds or Synchro, so a lot of the time it really would just be monsters. <coughs> Excuse me. It would just be a monster that they would get back, so it was more of like a soft lock that you could set up. It wasn't like now where you would actually get a plus off of it. Another card that people side deck were uh, uh, anti spell fragrance. This was against Dark Arm Return, which is another huge advantage of this deck against uh, this. That the reason why this deck could compete with Dark Arm Return and, and ultimately beat it until Teladad came out, which was just much faster and explosive. 
Um, this could they couldn't set, they had to set their spell cards, and by then you could just summon a GB, make Bestiari pop it, you know. So uh, this was great. People opted to run anywhere from two to three prohibitions in mirror match or against this deck or other decks, lock decks. Um, you call like Treeborn Frog against Monarch, Soul Exchanges, things like that. Um, Prime Material Dragon, you know, sh just shit along that nature. Crush Card Virus, I've seen people call that for some stupid reason. People usually call Bestiari with this deck, and then they call either Darius or Laquari or Test Tiger. Um, Dust Tornadoes were great. Wabakus weren't as great, um, but they I still like to use them personally, um, just as a one of main and one side. Um, Wabakus were great, um, except in Mirror Match, just because there was a lot of Mirror Matches. Brain Control, I already discussed this earlier, but I would always main this. I don't give a fuck what people said, I always main this card personally. I didn't like the idea of siding it when I'm always just going to main, be main decking a power card that I, I could always use game one if I'm playing Mirror Match. It gives me a huge advantage. And uh, this card stole games in itself. Um, <coughs> One of the most insane cards in the game to ever to ever exist. Similarly, mind control. A lot of people side deck two of these. Um, if they weren't already, if they if they had side deck one, if they had the brain control side deck, they would side two if they were maining it like me. Um, you could steal uh, mirror match GBs, so that's what this was used for. Econ uh, kind of acts like a versatile book of moon, mainly for mirror match monarchs. You could run their shit over, steal their stuff. If it was mirror match, you could you could steal their stuff, tag out. Um, a lot of versatile plays. Another card against monarchs and GBs. It was also used against GBs, like I said. It was Jujutsu Master. Top decking cards was huge in this format. He had a huge attack. 1300 is actually a lot of attack, believe it or not. Um, you could set it. It slow rolls opponents. Even if they kill it, it's still top decks, and it makes them lose a turn. If you attack with this guy, and they attack it, you could book a moon this. They att the attack resolves. They top deck their monster. It's just, it nets you pluses. It's, it's a great card. Another card that people didn't run for the longest time up until after Cold Wave hit one was Giant Trunade, and then after uh, Cold Wave was banned, Trunade was banned. Um, Trunade, um, I always loved this card. This is one of my favorite cards. It's actually one of the first mass removal cards in the game that I liked, aside from Heavy Storm, because a lot of people didn't really... I didn't even find out Cold Wave existed until, like, this time, which is when people first, like, really discovered Cold Wave. But uh, I always liked using Giant Trunade. It was just... It was another mass clearing card. It forced out Solemn Judgments, which is really why I liked it. It was more of a great late game card, more so than anything else. It really wasn't like an explosive. There weren't as many OTKs with this deck per se, but you still could do it. And then another card that was at three that people didn't really run, except in Oppression Monarchs, was a uh, Royal Oppression. <coughs> it was at three. I actually ran two in my side deck, mainly against uh, mainly against this deck in Mirror Match, and I could shut down my own stuff. People were running Twisters at the time, so they could Twister their own Royal Oppression. I also ran the True Nade because I could bounce this back to my hand. I could bounce back my Prematures. I could bounce back my Prohibitions and reuse them. I could set it and then potentially reset a, a Fragrance if I really, really needed to. Like, so many versatile plays. That's the deck. I apologize. This retro deck profile was so long. I really want to keep this short, but uh, I, I have that nostalgia factor, and I really love this deck. One of my favorite decks of all time. I hope you guys enjoyed this. If you guys want me to do another retro deck profile around this time, I wanted to either do... I think I've done Teledad. I don't know if I've already done Teledad, but it's, it's kind of an obvious deck profile. I might do that. I wanted to do Prime Material Monarchs. I wanted to do a couple of the first, very first SJCs in Yu-Gi-Oh! from uh, 2004 um, or 05, 06, you know, that area. The first SJCs of the time. I wanted to do some winning deck lists so you guys could understand what the formats were like, how slow they were, how, how people thought during those times, why they won, how they won, um, things like that. So I want to do a couple more retro deck profiles. I apologize this was a long video. If you guys enjoyed this video and stuck out throughout this entire time, please give this video a thumbs up. I'd really appreciate it. I put in a lot of time and work into this, and I try to give you guys my best insight into the game. Um, and I'll be doing a lot more videos in the next couple days. Um, if this video, my last video got over 100 likes. If this video gets over 100 likes, I will post another video probably by tomorrow night. If not, tomorrow's Wednesday. If not by tomorrow night, Wednesday, then probably by Thursday in the morning. Um, so if you guys enjoyed that, like I said, thumbs up, give this video a like, drop a comment down below if you guys um, have any video ideas or what you guys want me to post next. Comment down below with um, the next retro deck profile you guys would, would like to see. If you guys haven't seen my other retro deck profiles, go check them out. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, but yeah, I love each and every one of you guys. Peace. Thumbs up this video. And uh, yeah, Inch95 out.